Tennessee's Partner by Bret Hart. I do not think that we ever knew his real name. Our ignorance of it certainly never gave us any social inconvenience. For at Sandy Bar in 1854, most men were christened anew. Sometimes these appellatives were derived from some distinctiveness of dress, as in the case of Dungaree Jack, or from some peculiarity of habits as shown in Sliterous Bill, so called from an undue proportion of that chemical in his daily beard, or for some unlucky slip, as exhibited in the Iron Pirate, a mild inoffensive man who earned that baleful title by his unfortunate mispronunciation of the term Iron Pirates. Perhaps this may have been the beginning of a rude, rude heraldry, but I'm constrained to think it was because a man's real name in that day rested solely upon his own unsupported statement. Call yourself Clifford, do you? said Boston, addressing a timid newcomer with infinite scorn. Hell is full of such Cliffords. He then introduced the unfortunate man, whose name happened really to be Clifford, as J. Bird Charlie, an unhallowed inspiration of the moment that clung to him ever after. But to return to Tennessee's partner, whom we never knew by any other than his relative title, that he had ever existed as a separate and distinct individuality, we only learned later. It seems that in 1853, he left Poker Flat to go to San Francisco, ostensibly to procure a wife. He never got any farther than Stockton, well, at that place he was attracted by a young person who waited upon the table at the hotel where he took his meals. One morning he said something to her which caused her to smile not unkindly, to somewhat coquettishly break a plate of toast over his upturned, serious and simple face, and to retreat to the kitchen. He followed her and emerged a few moments later, covered with more toast and victory. That day of the week they were married by a justice of the peace and returned to Poker Flat. Now, I'm aware that something more might be made of this episode, but I prefer to tell it as it was current at Sandy Bar, in the gulches and bar rooms, where all sentiment was modified by a strong sense of humor. Of their married felicity, but little is known, perhaps for the reason that Tennessee, then living with his partner, one day took occasion to say something to the bride on his own account, at which, it is said, she smiled not unkindly and chastely retreated. Well, this time as far as Marysville, where Tennessee followed her, and where they went to housekeeping without the aid of a justice of the peace. Tennessee's partner took the loss of his wife simply and seriously, as was his fashion. But to everybody's surprise, when Tennessee one day returned from Marysville without his partner's wife, she having smiled and retreated with somebody else. Tennessee's partner was the first man to shake his hand and greet him with affection. The boys who had gathered in the canyon to see the shooting were naturally indignant. Their indignation might have found vent in sarcasm, but for a certain look in Tennessee's partner's eye that indicated a lack of humorous appreciation. In fact, he was a grave man, with a steady application to practical detail, which was unpleasant in a difficulty. Meanwhile, a popular feeling against Tennessee had grown up on the bar. He was known to be a gambler. He was suspected to be a thief. In these suspicions, Tennessee's partner was equally compromised. His continued intimacy with Tennessee after the affair above quoted could only be accounted for on the hypothesis of a co-partnership of crime. At last, Tennessee's guilt became flagrant. One day, he overtook a stranger on his way to Red Dog. Well, the stranger afterward related that Tennessee beguiled the time with interesting anecdote and reminiscence but illogically concluded the interview in the following words. And now, young man, I'll trouble you for your knife, your pistols, and your money. You see, your weapons might get you into trouble at Red Dog, and your money's a temptation to the evilly disposed. I think you said your address was San Francisco. I shall endeavor to call. It may be stated here that Tennessee had a fine flow of humor, which no business preoccupation could wholly subdue. Well, this exploit was his last. Red Dog and Sandy Bar made common cause against the highwaymen. Tennessee was hunted in very much the same fashion as his prototype, the grizzly. Well, as the toils closed around him, he made a desperate dash through the bar, emptying his revolver at the crowd before the arcade saloon, and so on up Grizzly Canyon. But at its farther extremity, he was stopped by a small man on a gray horse. 
The men looked at each other in a moment of silence. Both were fearless, both self-possessed and independent, and both types of a civilization that in the 17th century would have been called heroic, but in the 19th, simply reckless. "'What have you got there, I call?' said Tennessee quietly. Two bowers and an ace,' said the stranger, just as quietly, showing two revolvers and a bowie knife. "'Oh, that takes me,' returned Tennessee. And with this gambler's epigram, he threw away his useless pistol and rode back with his captor. It was a warm night. The cool breeze, which usually sprang up with the going down of the sun behind the chaparral-crested mountain, was that evening withheld from Sandy Bar. The little canyon was stifling with heated, resinous odors, and the decaying driftwood on the bar sent forth faint, sickening exhalations. The feverishness of day and its fierce passion still filled the camp. Lights moved restlessly along the bank of the river, striking no answering reflection from its tawny current. Against the blackness of the pines, the windows of the old loft above the express office stood out staringly bright. And through their curtainless panes, the loungers below could see the forms of those who were even then deciding the fate of Tennessee. And above all this, etched on the dark firmament, rose the Sierra, remote and passionless, crowned with remoter passionless stars. The trial of Tennessee was conducted as fairly as was consistent with a judge and jury who felt themselves to some extent obliged to justify, in their verdict, the previous irregularities of arrest and indictment. The law of Sandy Bar was implacable, but not vengeful. The excitement and personal feeling of the chase were over. With Tennessee safe in their hands, they were ready to listen patiently to any defense, which they were already satisfied was insufficient. There being no doubt in their own minds, they were willing to give the prisoner the benefit of any that might exist. Secure in the hypothesis that he ought to be hanged on general principles, they indulged him with more latitude of defense than his reckless hardihood seemed to ask. The judge appeared to be more anxious than the prisoner, who, otherwise unconcerned, evidently took a grim pleasure in the responsibility he had created. Well, I don't take any hand in this here game, had been his invariable but good-humored reply to all questions. The judge, who was also his captor, for a moment vaguely regretted that he had not shot him on sight that morning, but presently dismissed this human weakness as unworthy of the judicial mind. Well, nevertheless, when there was a tap at the door, and it was said that Tennessee's partner was there on behalf of the prisoner, he was admitted at once without question. Perhaps the younger members of the jury, to whom the proceedings were becoming irksomely thoughtful, hailed him as a relief. For he was not certainly an imposing figure. Short and stout, with a square face, sunburned into a preternatural redness, and clad in a loose duck jumper and trousers, streaked and splashed with red soil. His aspect under any circumstances would have been quaint, and was now even ridiculous. As he stooped to deposit at his feet a heavy carpet bag he was carrying, it became obvious from partially developed legends and inscriptions that the material with which his trousers had been patched had been originally intended for a less ambitious covering. Yet he advanced with great gravity, and, after having shaken the hand of each person in the room with labored cordiality, he wiped his serious perplexed face on a red bandana handkerchief, a shade lighter than his complexion, laid his powerful hand upon the table to steady himself, and thus addressed the judge. I was passing by, he began by way of apology, and thought I'd just step in and see how things was getting on with Tennessee there, my partner. It's a hot night. I disremember any such weather before on the bar. He paused a moment, but nobody volunteering any other meteorological recollection, he again had recourse to his pocket handkerchief, and for some moments mopped his face diligently. "'Have you anything to say in behalf of the prisoner?' said the judge finally. "'Ah, oh, that's it,' said Tennessee's partner, in a tone of relief. "'I come here as far as Tennessee's partner, knowing him on nigh on four years off and on, wet and dry and luck and out of luck.' His ways ain't ours my ways, but thar ain't any pints in that young man, that thar ain't any liveliness as he's been up to as I don't know. And you says to me, says you, confidential like, and between man and man, says you, do you know anything in his behalf? Well, I says to you, says I, confidential like, as between man and man, what should a man know of his partner? Is this all you have to say? asked the judge impatiently. 
feeling perhaps that a dangerous sympathy of humor was beginning to humanize the court. Well, that's so, continued Tennessee's partner. It ain't for me to say anything again him. And now what's the case? Well, here's Tennessee wants money, wants it bad, and doesn't like to ask it of his old partner. Well, what does Tennessee do? He lays for a stranger and he fetches that stranger. And you lays for him and you fetches him. And the honors is easy. And I put it to you being a fair-minded man and to you, gentlemen all, as far-minded men, if this isn't so. Prisoner, said the judge interrupting. Have you any questions to ask this man? No, no, continued Tennessee's partner hastily. I play this here hand alone. It's come down to the bedrock, it's just this. Tennessee there has played it pretty rough and expensive like on a stranger and on this here camp. And now what's the fair thing? Some would say more, some would say less. Here's $1,700 in course, a gold and a watch. It's about all my pile and call it square. And before a hand could be raised to prevent him, he'd empty the contents of the carpet bag upon the table. Well, for a moment, his life was in jeopardy. One or two men sprang to their feet, several hands groped for hidden weapons, and a suggestion to throw him from the window was only overridden by a gesture from the judge. Well, Tennessee laughed. And apparently oblivious of the excitement, Tennessee's partner improved the opportunity to mop his face again with his handkerchief. When order was restored and the man was made to understand by the use of forcible figures and rhetoric that Tennessee's offense could not be condoned by money, his face took a more serious and sanguinary hue, and those who were nearest to him noticed that his rough hand trembled slightly on the table. He hesitated a moment as he slowly returned the gold to the carpet bag, as if he had not yet entirely caught the elevated sense of justice which swayed the tribunal, and was perplexed with the belief that he would not offered enough. Then he turned to the judge and saying, This year's lone hand played alone and without my partner. He bowed to the jury and was about to withdraw when the judge called him back. Well, if you have anything to say to Tennessee, you'd better say it now. Well, for the first time that evening, the eyes of the prisoner and his strange advocate met. Tennessee smiled, showed his white teeth and saying, Well, you could, old man. He held out his hand. Tennessee's partner took it in his own and saying, well, I just dropped in as I was passing to see how things was getting on. He let the hand passively fall, and adding that it was a warm night, again mopped his face with his handkerchief, and without another word, he withdrew. The two men never again met each other alive, for the unparalleled insult of a bribe offered to Judge Lynch, who, whether bigoted, weak, or narrow, was at least incorruptible firmly fixed in the mind of that mythical personage any wavering determination of Tennessee's fate. And at the break of day, he was marched, closely guarded, to meet it at the top of Marley's Hill. How he met it, how cool he was, how he refused to say anything, how perfect were the arrangements of the committee, were all duly reported with the addition of a warning moral, an example to all future evildoers, in the Red Dog Clarion by its editor, who was present and to whose vigorous English I cheerfully refer the reader. But the beauty of that midsummer morning, the blessed amity of earth and air and sky, the awakened life of the free woods and hills, the joyous renewal and promise of nature, and above all, the infinite serenity that thrilled through each, was not reported as not being a part of the social lesson. And yet when the weak and foolish deed was done, and a life, with its possibilities and responsibilities, had passed out of the misshapen thing that dangled between earth and sky. The birds sang, the flowers bloomed, the sun shone as cheerily as before, and possibly the red dog clarion was right. Tennessee's partner was not in the group that surrounded the ominous tree, but as they turned to disperse, attention was drawn to the singular appearance of a motionless donkey cart, halted at the side of the road. Well, as they approached, they at once recognized the venerable Jenny and the two-wheeled cart as the property of Tennessee's partner, used by him in carrying dirt from his claim, and a few paces distant, the owner of the equipage himself, sitting under a buckeye tree, wiping the perspiration from his glowing face. In answer to an inquiry, he said he'd come for the body of the diseased, if it was all the same to the committee. He didn't wish to hurry anything, he could wait. He was not working that day, and when the gentlemen were done with the diseased, he would take him. If there is any present, he added, in his simple, serious way, 
As would care to join the funeral, they can come. Perhaps it was from a sense of humor, which I've already intimated was a feature of Sandy Bar. And perhaps it was from something even better than that. But two-thirds of the loungers accepted the invitation at once. It was noon when the body of Tennessee was delivered into the hands of his partner. As the cart drew up to the fatal tree, we noticed that it contained a rough oblong box, apparently made from a section of sluicing and half filled with bark and the tassels of pine. The cart was further decorated with slips of willow and made fragrant with buckeye blossoms. When the body was deposited in the box, Tennessee's partner drew over it a piece of tarred canvas and, gravely mounting the narrow seat in front with his feet upon the shafts, urged the little donkey forward. The equipage moved slowly on at that decorous pace which was habitual with Jenny, even under less solemn circumstances. The men, half curiously and half jestingly, but all good-humoredly, strolled along beside the cart, some in advance, some a little in the rear of the homely cattle folk. But whether from the narrowing of the road or some present sense of decorum as the cart passed on, the company fell to rear in couples, keeping step and otherwise assuming the external show of a formal possession, procession. Jack Follinsby, who had the outset played a funeral march in dumb show upon an imaginary trombone, desisted from a lack of sympathy and appreciation. Not having, perhaps, your true humorist's capacity to be content with the enjoyment of his own fun. Well, the lay, wed, the lay way led through Grizzly Canyon, by this time clothed in funeral drapery and shadows. The redwoods, burying their moccasined feet in the red soil, stood in Indian file along the track, trailing an uncouth benediction from their bending boughs upon the passing bier. A hare, surprised into helpless inactivity, sat upright and pulsating in the ferns by the roadside as the cortege went by. Squirrels hastened to gain a secure outlook from higher boughs, and the blue jays, spreading their wings, fluttered before them like outriders until the outskirts of Sandy Bar were reached and the solitary cabin of Tennessee's partner. Well, viewed under more favorable circumstances, it would not have been a cheerful place. The unpicturesque sight, the rude and unlovely outlines, the unsavory details which distinguished the nest building of the California miner were all here, with the dreariness of decay superadded. A few paces from the cabin, there was a rough enclosure, which in the brief days of Tennessee's partner's matrimonial felicity had been used as a garden, but was now overgrown with fern. As we approached it, we were surprised to find that what we'd taken for a recent attempt at cultivation was the broken soil about an open grave. The cart was halted before the enclosure, and rejecting the offers of assistance with the same air of simple self-reliance he had displayed throughout, Tennessee's partner lifted the rough coffin on his back and deposited it unaided within the shallow grave. He then nailed down the board which served as a lid, and, mounting the little mound of earth beside it, took off his hat and slowly mopped his face with his handkerchief. Well, this, the crowd felt, was a preliminary to speech, and they disposed themselves variously on stumps and boulders and sat expectant. When a man, began Tennessee's partner slowly, has been running free all day, what's the natural thing for him to do? Why, to come home. And if he ain't in a condition to go home, what can his best friend do? Why, to bring him home. And here's Tennessee has been running free, and we brings him home from his wandering. He paused, and picked up a fragment of quartz and rubbed it thoughtfully on his sleeve, and went on. It ain't the first time that I've packed him on my back as you seed me now. It ain't the first time that I brought him to this year cabin when he couldn't help himself. It ain't the first time that I and Ginny have waited on him on yon hill, and picked him up and so fetched him home, when he couldn't speak and didn't know me. And now that it's the last time, why... He paused and rubbed the quartz gently on his sleeve. You see, it's sort of rough on his partner. And now, gentlemen, he added abruptly, picking up his long-handled shovel. The funeral's over, and my thanks and Tennessee's thanks to you for your trouble. Resisting any proffers of assistance, he began to fill in the grave, turning his back upon the crowd that, after a few moments' hesitation, they gradually withdrew. As they crossed the little ridge that hid Sandy Bar from view, some, looking back, thought they could see Tennessee's partner, his work done, sitting upon the grave, his shovel between his knees, and his face buried in his red bandana handkerchief. But it was argued by others that you couldn't tell his face from his handkerchief at that distance, and this point remained undecided. In the reaction that followed the feverish excitement of that day, 
Tennessee's partner was not forgotten. A secret investigation had cleared him of any complicity in Tennessee's guilt and left only a suspicion in his general sanity. Sandy Barr made a point on calling on him and proffering various uncouth but well-meant kindnesses, but from that day his rude health and great strength seemed visibly to decline. And when the rainy season set fairly in and the tiny grass blades were beginning to peep from the rocky mound above Tennessee's grave, he took to his bed. One night when the pines beside the cabin were swaying in the storm and trailing their slender figures over their roof, and the roar and rush of the swollen river were heard below. Tennessee's partner lifted his head from the pillow, saying, It's time to go for Tennessee. I must put Ginny in the cart, and would have risen from his bed but for the restraint of his attendant. Struggling, he still pursued his singular fancy. There now, steady, steady, Jenny, old girl. How dark it is. Look out for the ruts, and look out for him too, old gal. Sometimes, you know, when he's blind drunk, he drops down right in the trail. Keep on straight up to the pine on top of the hill. There, I told you so. There he is, coming this way too, all by himself, sober and his face a-shining. Tennessee, partner. And so they met. <laughs>